appreciate everybody's words, everybody's wisdom. Uh, but we have to be honest that we've heard this before. Um, especially, I want to go back to 1967. That's 50 years. Linda Bain Johnson, I'll quote. He says, police recruitment should be modernized to reflect education, personality, and assessment of performance. The need is urgent for police to improve relations with the poor, minority groups, and juveniles. This is 50 years ago. So my question is, how long, how much time do we need before lip service becomes practice? And how did condemn be equated to my blackness? Those are my two questions for the panel. Can you say the last part? How did my being condemned be equated to my blackness? Because we all, we all see, because white neighborhoods aren't policed like black neighborhoods. I'm 24 years old and I've had trouble with the police. My 23-year-old cousin has trouble with the police. My six-year-old cousin has trouble with the police. But my white counterpart, he thrives. His school thrives. His neighborhood thrives. But the dope is still there. So why did condemnation be related to blackness? And how long are we going to have to put theory into practice with no more lip service? So those are my questions. Those are three really powerful questions. I need some powerful answers. Yeah. So um, I didn't know it was three. I got two. Okay. So, so, the, so the first part was, um, you know, how long would change take? And um, I think that's a good question, but I don't think it's a numerical answer. I think it really takes time, and really I think it, it takes the police department and the community members to really come together. And as soon as that happens, then, then we could talk about how much do we think far as time-wise I think we could move forward. Um, and then you discuss the uh, condemn you know, feeling condemned um, as a, a, a black male. Um, and I think that also comes with holding our police department accountable, in a sense, being feeling, making us feel, what can I say? Putting together policies, structures within our urban areas that makes us more empowered when it comes to the way police go about handling conducts, handling calls. Uh, I think that that's when we could get to a better place when it comes to that. Um, that's from my point of view. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I suspect you know that that the criminal justice system, as a system, has always been used for the same purpose. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, that you 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 know criminalize the, you know the behavior of, of black people. Um, you, even if you have to you know in different periods of time make up crimes that you can, can charge black people with, and you use the police and the criminal justice system and incarceration and all of that as a as a as a, as a way to try to manage us, and that's, I think, always been the case, which then the issue of, you know, how do you undo that um, is, a, is a much broader question than what any of us are talking about today, because uh, you really have to um, address the underlying problem, which is the need of white to maintain their sense of self-worth and self-esteem by putting somebody else down. And as long as they have to do that, then that kind of behavior and behavior, other behaviors that are comparable to it will continue to exist. And, and unless we suddenly get enough power to somehow stop it. Right. Or just a power play, which, you know, maybe that happens when, when, when we have majority which I guess is the fear of evolution to the point. So, Nancy, can I say one thing? Sure thing. Okay, so I'm, this is a very deep question, and I'm going to answer it much more superficially, which is about the police. That, you know, policing in America is a very local phenomenon, and irrespective of what might be going on the national level, what I've seen in the last 20 years is a lot of police departments have recognized the need to change their relationship to the communities that they police. I certainly wouldn't say all of them, 
but many, an impressive number, an increasing number. The chief was talking before the panel with us about Providence as an example, but I don't think Providence is the only example. I think there are a lot of communities in America where the police have tried to really rethink the role of policing. So I certainly say that the glass is not empty, maybe half full. Thank you. Uh, so specifically towards the issue of recruitment. So without question, I believe we are in a transformational time in policing today. Uh, in fact, surrounding the use of force, you saw that the IACP, the national think tank that represents all chiefs of police internationally around the world, and the FOP who represent all the police officers in the United States teamed up together with a use of force report. So that's one way that it's transforming. As well, be a recruitment to your question. So. I speak in the community all the time, and we're in the uh, community all the time, and that not only myself, but the command staff, and towards the Montre's point of hopelessness, it's a complicated profession, policing. And we'll speak to young men of color in the community all the time. Look, if you're intrigued by what we do, apply, because we can't reach our numbers, and it's your community. You should want to become, we, we should have greater numbers from your community. And they don't feel that we're truthful in what we say. So recently, we've gone where we had a unbelievable recruitment drive uh, surrounding the diverse community, 71% of the last drive, 60-person police academy. We run our own academy. 71% were minority when you take out white females. It was 65%. So we did well. But as well, we really went out on a limb, and I was somewhat criticized by some in the community in that if we're going to be true to our word in the community and say look apply for the job some young men of color in the community have been roughed up no question about it and i think policing in america has to look at what type of individual is best served to represent their communities we took a young man we did a, a program called dmi drug market intervention put on by David Kennedy out of John Jay College, and the young man captured in this thing of slinging on the corner or giving an opportunity to turn their lives around and getting some social service resources on the back end. One young man was told what he needed to do. His dream was to become a police officer. He was never charged criminally. However, he committed the act. He was caught on tape. It was, had, it, had he been charged criminally, But he was given that opportunity and, and told, here's what you need to do to improve your lot in life. And he did everything. He, uh, he, he applied for the police department and I chose him. So we were truthful to our word that you can't make the province the police department. You can't make the police department from your own community if, uh, if you okay. um, I just want to thank all of you. in Jersey City where a lot of my students have you know, experienced harassment and really limited interactions with the police. And I think, um, I don't know, like to the, to the question of increasing uh, you know, diversity in police departments, it's definitely an important goal, but at the same time we see videos from New York about stop and press where you know, black cops are having to be part of the system too and having quotas that they've had to fill in terms of going out and you know there, there are so many things um, going on here and as Dr. Dudley said this is a systemic thing like we know this is the new Jim Crow we know this is something that is you know it's part of the design and I think the one suggestion in terms of policy about uh, more transparency transparency and having to publish statistics is definitely important but are there any other ideas that y'all have about, you know, federal things that you can be doing that kind of address these different aspects uh, of the issue? Well, the federal government was supporting a lot of these initiatives. In a, I'm sorry. Well, okay, so the federal government was providing a lot of support for training and efforts to reform the police, and I think it'd be a great idea if they still do that. 
We rely quite heavily on uh, federal and state grants uh, for training. Uh, we are embarking on some pretty big initiatives, including body-worn cameras, which uh, is a lot of training about, and some of the other initiatives. We have, in Rhode Island, we passed a statewide law called the CCPRA, the Comprehensive Community Police Relationship Act, pretty much a model nationally. Uh, some other states are looking at it, and it uh, identifies actions of officers uh, during car stops, pedestrian stops, and the collection of that data. And that as well requires some, uh, a lot of training for officers because it's completely new and foreign to them. So again, the, the, those federal grant opportunities are used towards the training, but as well we've done some things on the legislative side to address some of these issues. What about consent decrees? You mentioned um, being under a consent decree. Ours is different than the consent decrees you're referring to okay. today. The oversight commissions yeah, yeah. put on by certain departments that have uh, shown a pattern and practice of mm -hmm. uh, bad behavior on behalf of, the, on, uh, behalf of their department. But, uh, I know that um, Attorney General Sessions has stated that he's not a particular fan of consent decrees, and um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. I mean, maybe uh, you know, the, the law enforcement company I keep is different from, from the company he keeps, but the chiefs I talk to say, they love the consent decrees because um, they can say it's not them imposing these rules on their officers, um, and it gives them like added accountability to to impose on their officers. Um, but so it remains to be seen whether that will continue under the current administration. I, I think another thing that uh, you know recognizing the layers um, underneath the issues for which there needs to be training and. And, um, and development um, it becomes important and then it, it raises certain sorts of things. So for example, um, an acknowledgement of the fact that, that supervision and monitoring is as critical a part of the development process as the initial educational program. In other words, that given, given the layers of complexity involved here, saying to your officers, you know, you go away to this you know, two-week training on X, and, and somehow you're going to miraculously perform differently uh, is, is not reasonable given what you're really, really asking them to do. And so that monitoring the effects of the training, having, tr having skilled supervisors who can work with them around, you know, uh, helping them understand how they just did something right, helping them understand how they missed the ball here, how they get corrected, because it's that ongoing work around these issues that's going to result in substantive change. Um, uh, becomes an important part of the development process as much as the training program itself. And so just what was being said, for example, I mean, the use of cameras. The use of cameras, yes, it could help catch people doing something wrong, it could help, but it could also be used as a teaching tool, right? You can go back and look at each interaction, the good ones and the bad ones, and help people understand what's the difference. Uh, it's not just about um, proving your court case, right? I mean, it's about, uh, it's, it becomes, a, a, each photograph is a teaching moment. Each interaction is a teaching moment. Gentlemen, back. Yeah. <clears throat> just kidding, good afternoon. Um, I know we often, when we come to the panels and hearings such as yourself, such as uh, this one, we tend to hear a lot about the, the problem. So I would like to always get some take some concrete takeaways. So this question is uh, particularly for Lamontre, but it's open to anyone. Um, having a unique position within the Baltimore City Police Department, how have you leveraged your position within the police department in the community to foster community collaboration and trust? So it can give us concrete evidence within the community and something so we probably would not know that you have done within the department. Okay. Um, so one of the things I've been doing is trying to create more of a sense of uh, transparency uh, within the community. I've been on the ground boards, going out there on the corners, um, going to rec centers, and what we found was uh, a lot of the interactions they had with the police um, were levels of uh, bad communication that officers had with officers, like their language. Like, uh, 
one officer will say, for example, uh, get the off the street, you know, and this and that. So, so the language kind of makes that individual feel less than a, a human being, in a sense. Um, within the police department, it's been several times, um, it's, and you got to recognize my challenge, um, it, it's been several times where I, people have, people have uh, said crazy things to me, like, oh, you nothing but a, 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 a pig, a rat, you know, this and that. So I'm constantly, in my role, I'm constantly getting, uh, what can I say, uh, talked bad upon in certain, by certain community members. Majority of them, because I do great community work, they love what I do. But that's the that's that's the other end of the, the spectrum. Um, with that, I have to hold the police department accountable because if they do something wrong, it not only jeopardizes them, but it jeopardizes my name within the community and my safety. So it's been several instances where things the police department did it made the news, and I didn't find out. Until it hit the news, and I got people hitting me up, like, oh, what's the, what you doing, what's, the, what's going on? And I'm like, wait a minute, let me call the commissioner, let me call the chief, let me figure out what's going on. And it took me, literally, um, sending an email out to those at the top saying, hey, look, you need to have better transparency when it comes to uh, letting not only the people who uh, are on the board, but also the people within the community know what's going on and how can we make certain improvements to better the police and the community relationship. So, um, did, did that help you a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, in several events, too, I'll say. Um, one event that, that I think was real successful was uh, we did an event with high school students um, and Baltimore City Police officers. And what we did was we had an event where the young people were in a circle, and within this circle, officers said what their fear was. And you'd be surprised. A lot of the officers said their fear was of the police, especially the black officers. The black officers said, they just like I get the itch in my armpits, they get an itch in their armpits when they riding around within the community. And, and within that, it, it became very successful as a thing because the young people started to see the officers as human beings and that they both saw that both of them value safety, you know, and that's the key thing. So. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Good patient. Hi, right, thanks. Um, this is for Chief Clements, but if anyone can respond. I was just actually at a conference this morning where they were talking about the lack of standards in almost all states for um, dealing with young people, and particularly young people of color. So I was just wondering if your state has any standards that mandate police training on that, and also if your department does that. And I mean training in terms of things like adolescent brain development, um, implicit bias, uh, uh, dealing with youth with mental health and substance abuse issues, de-escalation, things like that. So uh, there's a bill up at the state house now for uh, de-escalation training and mental health training uh, that is not state. City of Providence with the uh, brain development and child development program that we've conducted. But it's not part of the post certification of police officers standard and training. So the answer is no to being formulated as standard and training. But we have so many programs that touch upon each one of the four components that you've addressed, including uh, relations with youth in the community, young uh, men and women, boys and girls of color. We run a program called YPI, Youth Police Initiative, that's similar to what Lamontre had just mentioned, where this is a fascinating program where predominantly done in public housing developments, uh, done by either locally with a former football player, played football at uh, Boston University, played one year with the Patriots. Uh, but anyway, Youth Police Initiative, they'll pick 10 or 12 at risk youth that have been touched up by law enforcement or uh, they have been a single family, they're not going to school, they're headed down the wrong path, and we'll pick a half dozen police officers, and they'll go through the 
this structured training program by NACA, the North American Family Institute. In the beginning, and we've done 13 now in the city of Providence, in the beginning you can tell the edge between the police and the young men, later with the young men, definite edge, where there's a dislike. And police officers uh, and the youth in the early sessions, they speak about their past and their history. And by session three, you see the bond form by the end, there's a public speaking component to the graduation program, and many of the young men and young women get to the microphone at the end of the session, and they get their certificate and their degree, and they talk about they really had no role model, no mentor in their, no mentor in their life, but my new role model is Jose or George or Steve, you know, I want to be a private school so it's a fascinating program. spent a couple days with the speakers we have. Uh, there's so much valuable information. What we're going to do, we're going to let everybody know when the recording is available. Uh, we will also send out um, some suggested readings that will come from our speakers. Um, and um, feel free to contact uh, me or uh, NPSC if you have any questions and want to get more involved in some of the work we're doing. And finally, I just want to thank the speakers. As I said, this was, we started thinking about this about a year ago, and um, it's kind of like a dream come true. And I, I, I'm so happy with uh, what each of the speakers has contributed that um, I, I, I just, 